that we might be able to approach your word, understand your word, and apply it to our lives. And that's what our prayer is today, that we will take the words that you would have us hear, apply them to our lives, so that we might be a light into the dark world of these nations. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, folks. Well, last week was a particularly difficult um, passage of Scripture to deal with. Um, I I don't think necessarily it's that difficult in content, but it deals with uh, some concepts that are uh, not easily articulated, I think. Uh, But it's very important to understand, I think, this curse uh, that is uh, uh, given to Canaan, because if you're driving towards Uh, Jewish history, Hebrew history, if you're driving toward seeing God's providence um, manifested among the nation, it's important to see uh, kind of where that uh, originated and potentially how. But here's the, I think, the critical point I tried to make last week. You know, there's a lot of people who have formed exceptionally dogmatic opinions uh, regarding what it means on uh, curses at at this time, as well as uh, racial and ethnic identities. Um, I do not believe that we can be absolutely dogmatic. Um, I don't think we're given, uh, at this point, at least uh, enough information to be truly dogmatic about a position. But here are here's a few things I think that we do need to keep in mind. Number one, sin hitched a ride on the ark. It was on the ark. It got on the ark, it got off the ark. Okay? I think we need to understand that there are only eight human beings that saw the antediluvian, the pre-flood world, and the post-flood world. And they were carrying with them their sin nature. The sins that occurred, such that they did on the ark, after, the, after they disembarked, are not original sin. Original sin goes back to the garden, and we won't study that at this point, but that's, that's original sin. Uh, it's important, I think, also to know that uh, this particular circumstance that we see in Genesis 9 uh, with um, uh, uh, the, the issue with Ham and Noah uh, and, and potentially Noah's wife, depending on uh, where your conviction resides in this, uh, is an example of sin. Uh, and that sin does come under judgment, as all sin comes under judgment. Uh, but whether uh, you subscribe to the uh, drunkenness uh, uh, interpretation, the voyeuristic uh, interpretations, uh, the uh, the sexual um, uh, interpretations, it is uh, undeniably sin, and it, it is judged, and there is a curse pronounced on the fourth son of, um, of Ham, and that would be Canaan. There is no curse, and we'll see this in just a moment, on Ham himself, and we will see why. But today I would like to get started, actually, in a place that might not seem very likely to you, But if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to um, uh, Luke chapter 24. That is the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And once you're there, if you could move towards the end, which is, uh, we will start in verse 44. This is Luke 24, beginning in verse 44. Uh, These are the words of Christ. This is post-resurrection. This is immediately preceding the ascension. But in verse 44 of Luke 24, he sa- it says, He told them, these are the words to his apostles, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Why would he have done this? This is pre-Pentecost. This is, pre, this is pre-Pentecost. So Christ himself opens their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Check. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and look, I'm sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high, and we know when that empowerment would come, and we see that in the book of Acts. So when we look at the origin of the nations, we can see from the very beginning that the gospel of forgiveness of sins and repentance 
is to be proclaimed to all the nations. Now, before we get all the way back into Genesis, I do want to turn your attention back into the Old Testament, but before we get all the way back to Genesis, I'd like to take a little stop in the book of 1 Chronicles. Now, this is a book that uh, very, very few people teach on, um, and uh, just a, by way of a little bit of introduction, um, the uh, author is generally, re uh, when you hear it taught, referred to as the chronicler. The Chronicler, and that makes sense since the title of the books are First and Second Chronicles. Uh, tradition, both Jewish and Christ Christian tradition, hold uh, that its authorship would be by Ezra. That they hold that Ezra would have been the the chronicler. What do we? What time period do we know Ezra to be from? Post exile. That's correct. So you're talking about that that uh, that that time period. Uh, after the um, the Israelites uh, the, the, uh, from the southern kingdom, uh, their, their 70 years of, um, of captivity in Babylon have been complete, and there's the restoration community that moves back into uh, the, the Holy Land. And so if that is in that generation uh, that, that Ezra uh, is, is, is doing his leadership and his teaching. But I'd like to draw your attention to 1 Chronicles chapter 1. A great place to start will be in verse 1. And I'm going to read a few of these things to the best of my ability. But I want you to look for something in here as I'm reading that might seem a little odd. Because there's actually three sections in what I'm about to read to you. And the first and the third sections are different than the second section. And I will label the sections as we get there. 1 Chronicles 1.1 begins, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. That's section 1. Picking up in verse 5, we have an almost verbatim repetition of what we see in the table of nations in Genesis 10. This is the second section. Japheth's sons, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Gomer's sons, Ashkenaz, Ripha, Togarma, and I have a difficult time with that. I want to call him Togarma. I want to call him Togarma. Maybe, maybe I'll just call him that. You won't know the difference. Neither will I after I say it about seven times. Javan's sons, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Rodanim. Anytime you see the ending I-M, that's plural. That's a pluralization. So you're talking about uh, uh, peoples, and same thing with Kittim or Kittim. Verse 8, Ham sons, Cush, Mizraim, Put, Canaan. There we go. Cush's sons, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Rama, Sabteka. Rama's sons, Sheba and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod, who was the first to become a great warrior on the earth. Mizraim fathered the people of Lud, Anam, Lahab, Napta, Pathras, Kasla. And the Philistines came from them, and Kaphtor. Canaan fathered Sidon as his firstborn in Heth, as well as the Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zimorites, and Hamathites. Shem's sons, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, Aram, Uz. You know anything about Uz? Anybody know who comes through Uz? We'll learn that a little later. Hull, Gether, and Meshach. A parkshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One of them was named Peleg, because the earth was divided during his lifetime. We'll get to that in more detail in a few weeks. And the name of his brother was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Shelef, Hazarmaveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Abel, Abimile, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, Jobab. All of these were Joktan's sons. That is section 2. And so we begin section 3. And by the way, if you're needing to um, uh, memorize scripture for recitation at Awana or something like this, this is the ones you want to go to. You can knock four of them off really, really easy here. Shem, Aparkshad, Sheila, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sarek, Nahor, Terah, and Abram, that is Abraham. Do you notice a similarity between the first and the third sections 
and a difference in that large second section, other than length. I think the, well, length, length actually plays a role in it. Because what you see here is a vertical line from Adam down to Noah. It is verticality, pure verticality. You see verticality then repeated from Shem down through Abraham. And you will see other genealogies that take you straight through David and Solomon, so on and so forth, all the way to Jesus Christ. But in that intervening section, that second section, you see both verticality through sons and grandsons, but you see massive lateral genealogy, huge genealogy. And I think the picture that the chronicler wants you to see here and that Moses also wants you to see when we get back to Genesis 10 is that it is critically important to see how you get from Adam to Noah. And it is critically important, as you see dispensationally, as God's chosen people from Abraham all the way through the time of Christ. Okay, That is a vertical alignment. But the nations are formed laterally. And yet, the blessings of the gospel, the call to repentance must be proclaimed and will be proclaimed to all of them. So let's back ourselves up now, back to, to Genesis chapter 9, before we get into, get into 10. We saw last week that in, in verse um, 25 of chapter 9, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, he being Noah, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Verse 27, let God extend Japheth. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Now, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. After the flood. This dude lives 350 more years. So Noah's life lasted 950 years, and then he died incredible lifespan, spanning what I think we could, we could say in terms of, of biblical history, old world, new world. Actually, old world, present world. Um, one of only eight people uh, that, that can, can stake that claim. But you see here, Canaan is cursed, not Ham. Why is Ham not cursed? Because it is Ham's sin that actually generates this oracle, this blessing and cursing from Noah. Why not Ham? We'll take you back to verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons. You don't get to curse people who are blessed by God. Just like the pastor has been talking about, the demonic possession cannot happen to a believer of God. You don't get curses placed on God's people. See, Ham was blessed by God. He's living under blessing. Okay? When we get to heaven, we will see Ham. He'll be there. Probably some good conversation will come out of that. But Ham will be there. But Noah and his sons are blessed. There is no capacity for Noah to place a curse, oracularly or otherwise, on Ham. It went to Canaan. And so then we get into the table of nations, and we will start in verse 10. Or verse 1, sorry. These are the family records of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They also had sons after the flood. Japheth's sons, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Gomer's sons, Ashkenaz, Ripha, Togarmah, and Javan's sons, Elisha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodanim. From these descendants, the peoples of the coasts and the islands spread out into their lands, according to the clans in their nations, each with its own language. So let's take a minute to understand who is receiving this message and when. First of all, we know the authorship of the first um, uh, five books of the Bible would be ascribed to who? 
to Moses. So we know that this is post uh, Egyptian slave situation. This is during the, the wilderness wanderings that, that he is receiving inspiration and writing this down and communicating this to the Israelite people. Why would he be doing this, do you think? Well, first of all, he's commanded to preserve their history and understand their future because they have not yet crossed into the promised land. The land, by the way, inhabited at the time by the cursed remnants of Canaan, the Canaanite people. It's important for him to give the history of what's about to happen here, and we see Joshua and others expand on it. Now, if we look to Ezra, we just talked about Ezra's chronicles. When did Ezra write? After the captivity in Babylon, after people are returning to the promised land. So God is preserving history time and time again, and it gives his people an understanding, and it gives his people a confidence that God is in control of history. There is no other historical example, no other historical artifact that even approaches this degree of specificity. None. We think about prehistory and, 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 and modern history, and some people will put modern history at about the 9th century B.C., you know who lived around the 9th century B.C., 900 years before Christ? You, if, if I told you um, Iliad, Odyssey, stuff like that, Homer, heard of Homer? Yeah, the Greek poet, okay, through oral tradition, that's about the 9th century B.C. That's when you start getting the kind of the monuments of, 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 of prehistory. Um, actually, probably modern history, you can trace back more towards the Mesopotamian region, and specifically the Chaldeans and the, and the Persians and whatnot. But that's when you get to really a, a, a modern version of history. So what we are actually seeing here predates that tremendously. Tremendously. Trying to think in my mind now uh, the, the cadence of these events. Uh, but um, uh, there would be a massive gap between Moses and, um, and, 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 and Homer. Massive gap. Okay? There would have been a gap between Moses going back to, to the Tower of Babel and the flood. Okay? This, is the, this is truly a, a, a unique document, not only in the fact that it, it, it's very specific, but in the fact that it does go laterally, not just vertically. Everything else that you see uh, in ancient history basically goes vertically because they're only interested in their own clan, their own family, their own nation, not this one. This one spreads out laterally. And you see that there are three sons, and you see that they had sons. So let's look at it, and I think I alluded to this two weeks ago. I cannot read this scripture without thinking of the sitcom and the opening of the sitcom, My Three Sons, with the, remember the legs, the cartoon legs, and they're tapping their, you know, they're, they're, they're tapping their feet. Some of you are getting this. Some of you have no clue as to what I'm talking about. Do you remember who the, kind of the, 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 the main, uh, the, the father in My Three Sons was? Fred McMurray. Okay, who had risen to fame um, uh, actually earlier than my three sons uh, might have even been nominated for award. I don't I don't remember this, uh, but do you remember the movie that he did uh, that kind of brought him to big fame? He did, yeah. But the, the one that got him the fame, was the Shaggy Dog, the Shaggy Dog. Anybody? Do not raise your hand. This predates me, about like Moses to Abraham and all that stuff. So. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the shaggy dog, his, his, his name on, on My Three Sons uh, was Stephen Douglas. I thought, was, I thought it was interesting because in My Three Sons, they got a dog, do they not? We go trivia here. And by the way, it's a shaggy dog. It's a shaggy dog, and they have a dog. Trivia, do you know that dog's name? Nope, that's Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie is awesome. <laughs> He's the best thing in that show. <laughs> but no, it's not, it's not Charlie. It, it is one of the most ironic animal names given. 
tramp. Why would there be a tramp? There is no lady in my three sons. Okay, so the, the sons would have been Robbie, Chip, and Ernie. You remember that? And I, if, I remember, if I remember right, and I may be misremembering this, I think Ernie might have actually been adopted. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, Robbie would eventually get married on the show, and guess what Robbie had with his wife? Triplets! <laughs> he had triplets. Um, one other um, uh, piece of trivia from that show uh, that you would never see today, but I think is actually kind of cool, and I thought it was, unfor unfor unfortunately, this will come as a revelation, my dad, I thought it was cool watching it at the time. What did you almost never see Stephen Douglas, Fred McMurray, without when he was walking around in the house with his sons? A pipe! That's exactly right. I was almost incessantly smoking a pipe. I, you don't see that, you know, today. When he was adjusting the rabbit ears on their television and all that, it was with a pipe in his mouth. He was doing all that. Um, but back to Tramp. Tramp's a cool creature. Um, he was trained by the same fella who trained Arnold from Green Acres. Same fella. In fact, they lived together. The guy, the guy owned all these dogs that trained them. Okay, and, and, and Arnold the pig. He also, um, he also trained Higgins. Does anybody know? Now, we're not talking Magnum P.I. here, predating Magnum P.I. Higgins was the mutt uh, that chased the, um, the, 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 the train in what show? Petticoat Junction. Yeah, there you go. That'll come back in a minute. But he was most famous for training a fellow named Benji. So Benji and Tramp and, and Higgins and Arnold all actually lived in the same place. And now, even though my dad thinks that, that these eight people who came off the ark only deserve one name, only need one name, I have decided to go ahead and name the wives. Um, this is not inspired. You, when you hear it, you know that it's not inspired. Uh, but it just helps me out because I'm going to call the, the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're going to be, to me, Bobby Joe, Billy Joe, and Betty Joe. Okay, so those are, those are going to be the wives of, of Ham, Sham, and Japheth. So, who's the oldest? Ham, Sham, or Japheth? And this, my friends, is a very tricky question. Nobody want to go out on a limb? We know it's not Ham. And we're going to go, some people will go with Shem. Let me give you some translations. New Living Translation say, Sons were born to Shem, the older brother of Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the descendants of Aber. Do you know why that word Aber is pointed out there? Aber's from the name we get Hebrew. That's where you get Hebrew from. New Living Translation, sons were born to Shem, the older brother of Japheth. New American Standard Bible, also to Shem, the father of all children of Aber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born but wait, the Aramaic Bible, and Shem begot sons also, the father of all children of Aber, the brother of Japheth the greater. So now you have a translation saying Japheth is older. Young's literal translation of scripture, as to Shem, father of all sons of Aber, brother of Japheth the elder. Well, that's interesting. Does anybody, is anybody reading from the New International Version today, the NIV? And what does it say? Oh, um, well, I, I'd, have, I'd have to go, but it should say, sons were born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Aber. It may not be in Genesis 10. It might be, it might be pulling from another one. King James Bible says, Unto Shem also, the father of all children of Aber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him the children were born. So you see there is some disagreement actually on the translation here. So some people will say that Ham, Shem, and Japheth were triplets. Even if they were triplets, they would have had a birth order. Okay, They would have had a birth, birth order. I do not believe that they were um, uh, uh, triplets. The Bible clearly states that Noah was 500 years old when he became a father, correct? We know that from Scripture. It's pretty clear. 
We know that Shem fathered Arphaxad when he was 100 years old. And it is recorded that he did so two years after the flood. The flood was a little over a year-long event. That means that Shem would have been 97 or 98 when the flood began. And how old was Noah when the flood began? 600. He was 600 years old. That means if Noah had started having sons at 500 years of age, Shem could not have been the oldest because there was a gap of two to three years and Noah would have fathered him at 502 or 503 years old. So Japheth may very well be the oldest son. But Shem is listed first. He's listed first. But does the Bible always uh, go with the eldest son first? The answer to that is no. 1 Chronicles 128, we just came from 1 Chronicles. The sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. So the scripture does not always record the oldest one first. How, how much older was, was, was Ishmael than Isaac? Anybody got that piece of trivia? 14 years. 14 years older. But it is through Isaac that the Abrahamic covenant flows down. No matter here. What we know for a fact is that Jesus Christ, Messiah, would come from the lineage of Shem. And there's more to that story. So we get back into verse 10. These are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, Japheth, the son of Noah. The sons were born to them after the flood. Every section in here is going to kind of follow a pattern. You're going to have the relationship to Noah, and then to Noah's son, and then an articulation of summary comment. There's rarely, rarely does this pattern even get broken when we're looking at the table of nations. There's some little diversions along the way. We'll talk about Nimrod next week, more than likely. But first we have to deal with Japheth, and then Ham, and then Shem. Shem is actually listed lineage last, because it is from that that the, la- the lineage of Abraham will flow. And that will clear the way to get into the story of the Tower of Babel, and that clears the way to get into the Abrahamic line. So we've read who the sons of Japheth were. So Japheth leads off. He's batting leadoff in the table of nations. Okay? Japheth's name means to enlarge, to expand, to be prolific, to broaden. What was the blessing given from Noah to to, to Japheth? Back in chapter 9. He will enlarge you. Let Japheth uh, dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be, be Shem's slaves. Okay? He will enlarge you. And it will be no surprise then that when we look at the progeny of, um, of, of Japheth, you will see that the Japheth line extends from Western Europe all the way down into the Indian-style peninsula. It makes a massive mark on the globe. Okay, So he's going to be enlarged. He's going to have a relationship with Shin, Shim. There's going to be a relationship there. It might surprise you to know, it might not, if you're, if you're into genealogy, but the royal line of England traces its lineage all the way back to Japheth through Magog and others. Noah was number 10 in the lineage, Japheth was number 11, Magog was number 12, according to the, 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 the royal genealogies published in 1892. Others will have it going back through some peoples down through Javan, but all lines trace back through King Alfred of the uh, ninth century. The Greeks trace themselves back to a common ancestor named Japatos. Does that look familiar to Japheth, perhaps? And the lines of Japheth will spread up north, northeast, and northwest, but from where? When I say they're going to move north, northeast, and northwest, but where are they, where's the originating point? Is it Ararat? It's actually from the plains of Shinar, because they're at, the, they're at that, 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 that confab of, of peoples at the Tower of Babel. And from there, they will be dispersed. So they will be on the plains of Shinar, and dispersed. 
These are prominently people from what's known as the Indo-European language family. And we think, wow, yeah, I've heard of the Indo-European language family, um, and, and we have. But it's pretty interesting that it isn't until the ninth, 19th century A.D. that linguists, ethnologists, and whatnot really began to piece together the, 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 the similarities in these languages and how they've borrowed from each other. William Jones, who was a British judge who has lived in India in the, in the late uh, 1700s, uh, just a few years after, actually after the um, uh, Declaration of Independence was signed here, he was the first credited with the first person to even talk about there being a kind of an Indo-European uh, civilization as manifested by diverse languages. People today still go to India to study Sanskrit. Okay. That is not the original language, but it does have a lot of implication. Well, Jones claimed in 1786 in a meeting called the Asiatic Society of Calcutta, no philologer could examine all three languages, and by that he meant Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek, without believing them to have sprung from some common source which perhaps no longer exists. So you see this massive spreading out of people all the way across. We were going to find Japhethites from, from Great Britain, from England, from Ireland, through Siberia, all the way down into India. So who are these people? I'll try to go through these pretty quickly. And I, well, before I do, let's, let's establish this. There has been a tremendous amount of assimilation over, over, over the centuries. Okay? And there, there's not a whole lot of dogma there's almost there's zero chance of, of pure lines, you know, at this point. Um, so you can't say, you know, well, they, they, they settled in this area. They may have settled in this area and then summarily got displaced. By the way, Attila displaced a lot of people, okay? He assimilated a lot of people. Alexander assimilated a whole lot of people, okay? So uh, coming out of the Tower of Babel, you had the sons of Japheth, and we'll start with Gomer, who was a grandson of Noah. Gomer's most common linkage is to France and Wales. Gomer, when you start breaking down and deconstructing the name uh, and the fact that the, the letter G and the letter C are very, very, uh, uh, very, very related, you end up with the, the, the term Gauls. Have you heard of the Gauls? Anybody know where the Gauls would have been? Uh, Fran yeah, in that, in that area, in Western Europe, ma mainly associated with French, but also you have Portugal, Port of Gaul, okay? So you have that, but also the Celts. You would have the Celts associated with Gomer, okay? And, and, but yeah, there would also have been folks in what we call modern-day France, and, we, and we, that's another problem that we run into as we begin to think of today's boundaries as, as, as trying to apply them there. But you would have had in Spain a, a place called Galicia, Galicia, okay? In Britain, you'd have had the Celts, which would have mixed with the Irish, the Scots, and the Germans, and the Slavs. The Germans would have been traced back through Ashkenaz, maybe even creating the Czech people. In Wales, you actually had a Welsh language. Old Welsh language is known as Gomerega, okay? So the migration from Gomer predominantly goes into Europe. Okay, westward towards the Atlantic. You can think of it this way. Wherever the French and the Danes have gone, you're probably seeing uh, remnants of Gomer often mixed with the remnants of, Ash of, of Ashkenaz. Maybe even as far as to portions of China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos could possibly be there as well. But Gomer has three, three kiddos. One of them is Rifa. And Josephus says probably settled in the northern areas of Asia Minor at that crossroads of continents. Maybe even would have had um, uh, 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 that area that we know as Constantinople, which would become modern-day Istanbul. Why did they change it? Yeah, Tori's laughing at this. She knows this is one of my favorite songs. That's nobody's business but the Turks. Trivia question. What was New York originally called? New Amsterdam, why'd they change it? I can't say people just like it better that way. That's in the song, look it up. Matt, did you ever look up the unicorn song? I didn't think you would. But from Riffa, you probably get the Lydians, um, 
Uh, they would have mixed with the Thracians, which we'll see a, a little bit later, uh, probably the descendants of Meshach and possibly Aram to the east. Then you have the great-grandson Ashkenaz, great-grandson of Noah. You need to predominantly think of the Germanic people here, but be very careful when you think of the Germanic people because the, the term Germanic was actually almost a pejorative term laid on people by the Romans, okay? Uh, but it would have been much broader in, in that day. Um, but Ashkenaz is actually the medieval na Hebrew name for Germany, okay? Um, even Ger Jews who lived in Germany called themselves, and maybe you've heard this, Ashkenazi Jews, okay? Um, likely began settling on the west side of that Black Sea. You know what the Black Sea is? Kind of in, kind of in contemporary history right now, contemporary news. Black Sea borders what? The Ukraine, as, as well as Turkey, as well as uh, um, uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan. Actually, I don't know if Azerbaijan actually reaches over there. But that, that area in Russia, obviously. Okay, from, um, uh, from the Black Sea, you would probably have gotten the Sarmatians, uh, the Danes, the Goths uh, from uh, his son Gotha, uh, the Phrygians. Uh, some of the churches to which are written um, letters are in Phrygia. You would have Albanus, who was another son of Ashkenaz. Where do you th what, do you, what type of people do you think would come from somebody named Albanus? Albanians, that's a clue. Uh, they eventually, in the Germanic people, they actually had a, a king called Vandalus. You ever heard of the Vandals? Okay, that's where this name comes from. There was also a king named Suvis, and from Suvis would have come the Angles, which would have been the Angles, which would have eventually become the Anglos who mixed with the Saxons. You would also have the Lombards, and this is my favorite of this group. You'd have the Pomeranians. They spoke in really yippy language, I think. Um, and accord, according to the hist historians, uh, Suvis uh, would have been uh, pretty much in the historical timeline a contemporary of Joseph. Okay, So if you're trying to place it in history. Then you have Togarma. Okay? Now you're starting to see the history of the Turkish people. Okay? These are the Turks, okay? Um, one historian of the 17th century says that Togarma had a son by the name of Tarki. There's your clue, okay? They would have started settling east of the Caspian Sea and on into Siberia. So they're going north as well. They would eventually confront, because they were fighting or kind of mixing in the same lands, with a group called the Scythians. The Scythians would have been the descendants of Magog, and they would mix into that culture, or into that people, and become known as the Hun Bulgars. The Hun Bulgars. You're going, huh, that sounds interesting. We just mentioned Night at the Museum. Attila the Hun, Bulgars, Bulgaria, so on and so forth. Um, the son of Torgomar is Bulgar, Attila the Hun, and then his brother Buddha, or it's uh, actually labeled in most his Blada, that's from where you get Budapest. Okay? Another son of Togomar was Ongol, and that would you know, be kind of linked to the Ottoman Empire. Some people say that Togomar uh, fathered uh, the Armenian people, and actually the, Armenian, the Armenians uh, actually trace it this way. Okay, now Josephus says that Hull would have actually been kind of the, the progenitor of the, uh, of the Armenian people, but those people lived in the same area, and it's, pro it's probable that they mixed. Now, what do we know about the, our Armenia? Any, any piece of trivia about Armenia? The first country, the first nation to actually indicate Christianity as being the state religion, okay? But the kind of interesting thing is there were no Turks in Turkey, okay, until the Byzantine Empire started to fall apart and they, they moved in. And then you get Magog, grandson of Noah, son of Japheth. You need to be thinking of Magog as north into Russia. These are the Magogites. I think I mentioned a few minutes ago some people, historians refer to them as Scythians. They would have also mixed with the Ashkenazi people, 
from Suvi, and you would get your Sweden or Swedenland. Okay? Irish records mention three sons of Magog, Bath, Jopta, and Fachacha. Then you end up with the Slavic people, okay, from north of the Black Sea to the Arctic, even across Siberia, across from Russia and the Ukraine. It's possible that Russia actually gets its name from Swedish Viking warriors from the progeny of Magog who were called the Rus. They were called the Rus. You will also find Magog lineages in Ireland and Scotland. And they were often in conflict with the people of Meshach because they are in kind of that same, same area. Okay? You also have linguists now putting together pretty solid theories about the linkages of the descendants of Magog and North American indigenous populations in terms of their languages, which would have made sense if these people would have moved into that far north and, and, and east. Um, I, yeah, they would have you know, been in proximity to uh, the potential land, bear, uh, land bridge of the Bering Strait. But you'll also see vestiges of Tubal and even the Sinites, okay, which we won't get there today, but that's in the, in the line of Ham. Then you have Javan. Now, Javan's the easiest one of us, I, easiest of the, of, the, of the crew, because it's pretty clear Javan is actually the Hebrew name for Greece. So here is where you start getting the, the, the Greeks. Probably the e easiest group to deal with. These would have been your maritime people, your coastland people, um, the sailors, the explorers. Um, if you are going to get married and you don't know which one of three gentlemen is your father, you're probably going to go to the Greek Isles and get married, and you will be part of a, of a play called Mamma Mia, set to the tune of Abba. Well, Javan has four sons, Elisha, okay? That is where you get the, uh, the term Hellenistic or Hellenic from, okay? Um, who was Helen of Troy? Uh, we just mentioned Homer now. He had a chance to Google this thing up. So who, who, was, who was Helen of Troy? She is said to be the offspring of Zeus and Leda. She was married to the king of Sparta. King of Sparta would have been what kind of city? Own, owing its allegiance to who? Sparta was a Greek city, right? The Greek confederation. She was taken captive to Troy. Her name was Helen. Okay? So from Elisha you get the, the Hellenistic Jews. You also have Tarsus listed here as a son. That would have been coastal Spain as well as some uh, descendants into Asia Minor. And an ineffective hiding place for Jonah. Kittim would have been your Cypriots. That would have been your, 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 your folks that you know, began to settle Cyprus and then from there branch out probably also into North Africa. The Dodanim or the Rodanim, that would have been your Dorian Greeks. And this is associated with the island of Rhodes, one of the largest islands in the area. Um, also home to one of the um, eight wonders of the, of the, or maybe the seven wonders. How many wonders? That, uh, it's got to be seven, because the eighth wonder was the Houston Astrodome, right? So the, the, the seventh wonder of the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, what do we know? The Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes, said to be a, a, a hundred foot statue at the harbor, you know, in Rhodes, dedicated to the Greek god Helios, also, by the way, a model for the Statue of Liberty. A model for the Statue of Liberty, and if you were a fan of Game of Thrones, it would have also been the inspiration for a statue in, in the books called the Titan of Bravos. Okay? But that's where you get the Dodanim. Now, Javan, more, more uh, uh, specifically, is associated with a, a phrase called Father Jove. Have you heard that one from your Edith Hamilton mythology? Okay. That would have been Zeus, okay, who would become known as Jupiter in the Roman iteration of the Pantheon. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but you can also uh, see uh, that there's a, a distinct possibility that these maritime people traveled as far as Indonesia. What is the largest uh, populated island in the Indonesian chain called? 
Anybody know that one? Java. That's right. Archaeologists are dis dis uh, discovering a whole lot of interesting there, things there. You have the Javan tiger. You have the, the Javan uh, hawk eagle. Uh, the Javan rhinoceros, which I don't think I want to want to meet. Okay. Um, there's also um, uh, some some interesting research done as to possibly these folks would have migrated all the way to Japan, and probably also along the coast of North Africa and, and Italy. Tubal, we won't go into this, we'll, we'll move very quickly. Tubal, mentioned eight times in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible, mostly associated with Meshach, which would have been your Muscovites, your, your Moscow folks. Um, that would have, they would have been settled in Tobolsk, uh, up in Siberia. But have you ever noticed the, the similarity between Siberia and Iberia, as in the Iberian Peninsula? Well, there you go. These folks would have spread out all the way from Siberia to Spain, as well as the Iberian area known as the Caucasus. Okay? A lot of these were likely uh, uh, assimilated into the Scythians. Some of them may have crossed the Bering Strait into North America. Meshach, son of Japheth, grandson of Noah, these folks went north. Originally, the Cappadocians of northern Turkey and the Caucasus region as well, which is kind of a bottleneck area. Um, much of northern Russia, including above Moscow and the Finnish people, the Finns. Interestingly, there is a unique uh, uh, a linkage to a group in Peru called the Moshi people. Then you have Tyrus. These would have been your Thracians. Your great warriors, modern-day Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria, Moldova. Um, the second largest city today in Moldova is called Tiraspol. Okay? Romania and Serbia, mostly southeastern Europe. They probably had influence on that city of Troy, even though that became prominently a Greek city by the use of a, a, of a horse. Um, probably mixed with the Ashkenazi people uh, to, uh, to give you kind of the Austrian line mixed with the Gomorites in northern Italy. And actually, there is a, a people in, in, that came from northern Italy called the Tyrosi that became known as the Etruscans. What do we know about the Etruscans? That's your Romanesque people. Madai, we will not go into Madai too much because we will get to see a lot about Madai. But does that sound like anything you know of in Scripture? Madai. Those are your Medes. Those are your Medes. In Iran, northern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. That would be uh, the Madai. Folks, we have a really strong accounting of nations. If you came today thinking that you would hear a little bit from me about this incredible event that has occurred in our country, announced on Friday, um, I don't want to you to take my silence on the issue as, as any indication that I do not acknowledge how momentous the Supreme Court decision was this week because it is truly historic. But a couple of things. It is completely possible to be on the pro-life side of the issue and to not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's possible. Okay? And we are called to be a light into an increasingly dark world but it is that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that, that, that really matters. Um, and this gospel that we, we proclaim is proclaimed now by the church to all the nations. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is that dividing line uh, between an eternity spent cohabitation with God Almighty and eternal separation and judgment from sin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, for the word, we thank you for your divine hand in history. Help us to understand how to apply it into our lives. We thank you for the, the trust and confidence that we can put in you, uh, that uh, even in your division of the nations, that you've made provision in the person of Jesus Christ. Point, point the world to him, Lord, because he is coming again. That is our hope, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.